We're glad you're here tonight. If you would come in and get a seat. It's nice to be in here, to, and we're glad you're here. Andrew is going to lead us as we sing together, and then Sundar will be bringing our devotional. We're glad you're here. Let's, let's sing together. If this song is new to anyone, we're going to find out right about now. Lead me gently home, Father. Lead me gently home, Father. afternoon. I want to tell about my friend. Um, so some of you might know I went to University of Memphis. Just when I was graduating, there was another uh, student. He came from India as well. And we became friends. And he would call me Baya. So I tried to teach some Telugu words today when we were in India. Didn't have much luck, but uh, here is one word. Kids, you can learn. Baya means brother. So he would call me Baya. Anyway, most recently he called me and he's like, hey, I have something to offer you. And I was like, great, what is it? Tell me. And then he says, I can give you stock advice. And I was like, oh, that's great. I didn't know you're an expert in stock market. And he's like, well, I am. And I was like, OK, great. So when will you start? When will you give me ad advice? And where did you learn? And then he goes, well, I'm not really an expert, but what happens is every time I buy a stock, it goes down. So my advice would be, <laughs> you, just, you just have to reverse my whatever I do, and you'll make money. So that's what he said. Um, so I brought it up because we understand ups and downs when we think about stock market, in the same way we understand our life goes in ups and downs as well, right? Sometimes we are, some call it mountain top, sometimes we are in a valley, um, not all the time life is straight, right? Have you ever seen anyone's life going like just straight up? Probably not. But what's constant is God. So. Bible tells us um, in 
Malachi 3.6, God says, I am the Lord, I will not change. And then Hebrews 13.8 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So even though we have ups and downs in our life, if we remember to go to our God, he is constant. He is not changing. Only thing that we need to remember, whether we are on mountaintop or in a deep valley, is to remember to go to God, and he is always there for us. So this Wednesday, I want to remind all of us to think about whether you are in high or low, think about God. And if you go to God in prayer, he is always there for us. Um, that's what I want us to remember, remind ourselves with. And this evening, if you are not in Christ, please come forward so that you can give your life to Christ. But if you are already in Christ and if you need prayers of church, please come forward as we stand and sing this song. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, uh, Sundar, for reminding everybody that I can't uh, learn any Telugu words, but, and I couldn't. I learned two, and that was enough. Uh, for now, I, I want to learn more. Our sympathy is extended to Jan Lynn Skelly and family and the passing of her mother, Patsy Smith. Funeral services will be tomorrow, tomorrow at the Kyerville Funeral Home. Visitation begins at 9.30. The service is at 11 a.m. Winnie Thomas had surgery yesterday. Uh, we want to pray for success and her healing. Also remember Jerry Asbill in your prayers. He is having surgery this coming Monday at Methodist Germantown. Also remember the Young at Heart Banquet that is uh, this Saturday. Make sure, yes, this Saturday at 5 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Sign up sheets are on the credenza in the South Hall. They have lowered the age limit, so that is good news. If you want to uh, be a part of that, that's great. Uh, diaper distribution is this Saturday, February the 17th from 10 till 12 uh, p.m. That's 10 till noon this Saturday at the covered entrance and back. It's our hope that more members can be a part of this process by having it on the weekend. And so they're doing a great job and we want to help them any way we can. The Elders Appreciation Luncheon is Sunday, March 17th, following the second service. The Faith Builders class is providing the meat and asking the congregation to bring side dishes and or a dessert. Sign-up sheets are in the adult Bible classes and on the credenza in the South Hall. It's very important. It's, we just need to know how much meat to buy. So if you could sign up if you're coming, and, and that's great. Also, this next 
Thursday night, a week from tomorrow night, on February the 22nd, there will be a meeting here uh, at 7 o'clock of those who are interested in uh, the work in Ukraine. That is Tom, uh, Tim Burrow and uh, Brandon Price will be in town. They're with the Sunset Institute of Biblical Studies. And Tim is the director of the school, the president of the school. And then Brandon Price is the one that's working in Donetsk when they can go and they're not going there now or Kiev. He's, um, he's an American, speaks, he and his wife are there. They speak Russian fluently. And so they're now, they've taken the place of J. Don and Mary Lee uh, Rogers who retired. Well, they'll be in town and they'll be going to several churches giving reports and he called and just said, if you're interested in knowing about what's taking place in Ukraine or what's taking place with U uh, Ukraine Biblical Institute, that's UBI in Ukraine, uh, please come to that meeting. They would just like to meet, it's very informal. They would just like to meet and talk about what's going on. So that's good news. And if you can't make it on Thursday, if you could let me know, I can let you know what their schedule is going to be during the week if you'd like to get with them and just talk about that. A lot going on. We're glad you're here tonight. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your love. We're thankful for your care and guidance. We're thankful for your activity in our lives. And we do know that you do care for us in the highs and in the lows. And yet, Father, we're, your, your love is steadfast and we're grateful for that. You answer our prayers. You give us what we need. We're grateful. Sometimes we pray for things that you know better uh, that we don't need and you answer our prayers in a way that would be bring a blessing to you so thank you for that we're thankful for our classes tonight and the teachers help them to be able to teach us and help us to learn we pray for the church here as we pray for the church around the world and there's so many people who are in difficult times and we pray for them we pray for peace both in ukraine in Israel, in other places. We pray for peace in our own city. We pray that men and women would start seeking your will and learn how to live peaceably together. We're thankful for the church. Help us at Germantown to grow both in number and in spirit. We pray for every man, woman, and child in this congregation. May you bless us always to be a blessing to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
Okay. Glad you're here, and I'm sorry. These guys are doing a great job back there, and I'm trying to get my PowerPoint uh, loaded, and if it loads, that's good. If not, we'll go to plan B. But if you would, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I want to look at a text because we're talking about the Church of Christ, who are we, and where, what are we becoming, and where are we going, and I think that's a good question. It depends on who you're talking to. Some people are positive, some people are not positive. And I think the church as a whole is very secure. Daniel chapter two says the church will not go out of existence. What we do as individual congregations is another challenge. And it may well be that what you have thought, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> what you have thought of is uh, a little different what you've experienced. Um, so, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is about a relationship. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I kind of hinted at it. Last Wednesday night, we talked about it. And then Sunday night, I was trying to address where we are with uh, just the way in which we communicate among our culture and what that means. So, I was reminded of a book that I read many years ago, written by Norman Bales. I don't even know Norman Bales, but I liked his book. It's called A Sense of Belonging. I remember I've taught it so much and read it so much that I just went ahead and had a binding. It's just a paperback book. But he actually talks about churches, congregational-wise, how do you build fellowship in a church? And it was the most practical approach to what's going on that I thought it was very important because he asks a good question. Suppose someone came in and uh, started visiting, what would they think of in the church if they just walked in and didn't know anything about the church from, uh, let's take the two big groups, you'd say Catholic and Protestant. And this was written back, well, I wanna say in the 70s, so at least the 80s. And so it was uh, 1989 copyright. So he is writing at a time and it's talking about, okay, let's, could you go to slide 67 if that's the same one we're on? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, but he's talking about the church. Well, th there you go now, or that's it right there. Right there is good, beautiful right there. Just that's perfect. All right, because I want to get to this culture part. We, we went through all of this even Sunday night. Who are we becoming? Thank you very much. And so he starts asking the question, why are we not, uh, why are we not keeping the people that we have in church? Why are they not remaining steadfast? That's 1989. I've heard that more in the past five or 10 years as if something major has happened. It's, it's the same issue. The same issue is there's a difference in evangelism and discipleship. Evangelism is getting someone in a right relationship with God, telling them the good news, and discipleship is taking them the next step. And how can I become a faithful Christian? He asked this question, wouldn't it be nice to be able to guarantee a new Christian that he will always experience the same kind of caring and attention that he receives when he is baptized? That's a good question. Wouldn't it be nice? Yes, it would. If you think in, only in terms of numbers, you won't go to the next level. The next level is nurturing and cultivating and watering. Does that make sense? I mean, it's like a, I can plant a garden but that's not the hardest part of planting a garden. That's not the hardest part. We have master gardeners in here. So uh, we know that that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is keeping it going and weeding and then caring for it, making sure it's, that it's uh, in a position to produce. First Thessalonians chapter one has, well, First Thessalonians has become a favorite book of mine because I suppose I spent a lot of time when I was working on a project uh, for it, for what the church is all about in chapter one, when you have a wor worthy goals for every congregation and he lists those, there are five. Won't go over that now, but look at chapter two when Paul starts talking about his relationship with them. 
in chapter 2, verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we'd already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit. But just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. For we never came with flattering speech, as you know, for with a pre or with, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ, we might have asserted our authority. But watch this. But we pro prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you'd become very dear to us. For you were called, brothers, our labor and hardship, our working night and day so as not to be a burden to any one of you. We proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you, uh, you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's, that's a pretty passionate plea. Listen, we gave our very lives and we were doing it because we cared about you. So it's not just a numbers game, it's a relationship building opportunity. So we're, we're talking about that now. When we look at the culture in which we live, think of this. Paul is writing to Gentiles. It's in Thessalonica, and we know he's writing to Gentiles because even in chapter one, Verse 9, he says, they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols. Jews wouldn't have worshipped idols. So he's talking about Gentiles. There's a, the culture is what you grew up in and how to come out of that to the culture of God. And we all have different cultures. And we could talk about it lightly. Sundar is uh, we're joking and he's joking with me when he's saying I tried to give you a few words and he would it took me a long time to get Telugu down I was doing pretty well and with that Telugu is what I started saying he said no Dave Telugu Telugu that's the name of the language so then I had to start thinking telephone telephone Telugu okay I can handle that well those, there's a big difference in culture in India and the culture in America but then even in America there's the southern northern Western, um, Eastern, border, park the car, you know, I had uncles and aunts living in Virginia, so we would smile, and then they lived in, we had, I had uncles and aunts in Georgia, so they, the word, <laughs> the number four had two syllables, fowa, that's what they would say, and I'd say, you know, it's just four, but no, they would say it a certain way, so we'd laugh at each other the way we talk because it's a different culture. What is culture? It's a broad set of beliefs and values that forms a collective vision of ourselves and others. And it's our identity and our behavior are shaped by our culture. And I, you know, I could start naming little things, but, and I don't wanna go there because that's when we get off on the issues. We start dealing with issues. But let's back up and look at it big picture. You have practices that you've done in your life and they're right. And things that you don't do and if someone does them, they're wrong. I could name a few, but I'm not gonna go there. We weren't, we weren't allowed to say the word stupid. That's a dirty word, stupid. Well, it's not, it's a, it's a moron. Moron is the word in the Bible. You know what moron defined is stupid. You know, it was just foolish. So our broad culture is our nation or country of upbringing. And then here's the facts about culture. It's learned over time. It affects our core values. So you learn some of that with your family. And when you come to the church, we have a church family. 
And we're learning, the beauty is that over time, the deeper our relationships uh, grow, we're able to reach out to others and we affirm each other. That's why a church is very important. It's very important for a church family to develop deep roots. Deep roots without being exclusive of other people coming in. And that's a challenge, isn't it? When you get it going like you want it, you don't want anyone to mess it up. Well, if the church is growing, we're looking at the numbers coming in, they've got to find a place too. So it affects our verbal and nonverbal behavior. It changes over time, and we talked about that lifestyle. So here are the co-culture issues, and race, uh, age or generation, we've, you know, I talked about this, so I wanna move on from this, but, but it's subdivided into all these areas, and we have our own little area like that we fit into. Sunday morning, it used to be our classes were divided up mostly by age. That's the way it used to be. I think it's changed now. I think that's for the better. So, uh, but on Wednesday night, our classes are really on topic. That's how we've tried to divide it up. And you may uh, find a topic that you want, so you go listen to someone as they're talking about that, uh, religion occupation. Now, let me get to this. This is the part. Why do we need to study culture? It's just like Paul. He spends a lot of his time talking about Jews and Gentiles. What, does, what is that like? If you were to go to India, it would be, as I'm learning, you're looking at the levels in their society. One level doesn't want to talk to another level. Okay, we've got to deal with that. And how are we going to deal with that? That's what Sundar is concerned with. To, number two, to interact respectfully and effectively with people from cultures and co-cultures different from our own. And it, as uh, Sundar, is, I keep using him because he's on my mind, but he's also very obvious with us. He and Asha, when they came, really did have culture shock moving in. Now they have a daughter, Sariu, who is, who is really more at home in American culture than she is at home. However, uh, that is in India. However, she's comfortable in both because she has family there. So she'll have the best of both worlds. Number three, to identify and address prejudice, discrimination, extremist ideas, and hate speech, which we are not good at as Americans. We tend to the extremes. And now, in our city, for example, we, have, we are so polarized that everything is an issue according to our differences rather than our similarities. It seems like the church ought to be leading the way in doing that. So culture shock is discomfort we feel when interacting in a new environment with few familiar cues to guide communication behavior. When, uh, and I guess that's why I do like going to a new culture just to see what it's like to move, to go in and you don't know. They're doing something and I don't know how to respond. I have to learn how to respond. If you go to Ukraine, when you go into home, you take off your shoes, always. You always bring a gift if you're going. They're going to give you a gift before you leave. You better bring a gift when you go in. Little things like that. Um, that wasn't hard for me because in Detroit, we took off our shoes too because you were coming in from snow and sleet and everyone. You could, you could pretty much tell if you looked at the doors, that's where all the shoes and boots were. So you just followed suit. Culture shock is common when moving to another country for work or study, but may also occur with a different co-culture. So when you're crossing these cultural lines, and that's what I was trying to say on Sunday night, crossing those, these cultural lines, that's the most difficult part of evangelism or reaching out in church growth is to find someone that's different than you and uh, develop a relationship. This man, he's a Dutch social psychologist his name is Geert Hofstede. You can have different ways of pronouncing it. But he came up with the six dimensions of cultural framework. I want to go through this quickly because I think this, this what, what um, I'm taking this from what people are learning in communication studies. That's exactly what Norman Bales did with the church. For example, he said, when we come to church, we all tend to go to our same place and we did this at Macon Road. I brought in, we had a class and I brought in a big poster, two posters and let uh, people 
just get in a group and, and it was a church building, where do they sit? And everyone could go right to the place of who sits where in the auditorium. Now I've noticed uh, that sometimes we have a Sunday morning schedule and a, or a pattern and then a Sunday night pattern. And some are going to be exactly where they are and it's the hardest thing because we've got now two rows that we're trying to um, hold for our parents of young children maybe of nursing mothers they could just slide in slide out without causing a big problem and so far we haven't had anyone that I've seen you know go and sit there they've respected that that's good news that's at least we're trying you know to do something like that but if co someone comes in and gets your seat what are you going to do you know that's a, that's a challenge isn't it seems so simple doesn't it you say, well, I wouldn't be like that. When I first came to, to, to Germantown, I was coming to speak one time, and I came, no one knew me, and in the old building, so I came down and, and I sat down. And a guy came up, he still goes here, and he denies he did this, but I was there, so I know. He came, and he stood right where I was, and he said, that's my seat. And uh, I don't know if he's kidding or not, I got up and moved back, but if I had it to do over again, I'd say it was but I was visiting, you know? So we get, we get so uh, much of it in a habit of this is my place and this is where I am uh, that, that we do that. Well, he came up with the six dimensions of culture. I wanna look at these, there's six dimension. And just look at the top one, like power, power distance. This is what people coming from different backgrounds are thinking about individualism versus collectivism. Masculinity, I'm going clockwise now at about four o'clock. Masculinity versus femininity or uncertainty avoidance. And then coming up to about eight o'clock, long versus short-term orientation. And then coming up at about 10 o'clock, indulgence versus restraint. So if you look at these, every one of these, for example, power, you may not even think of this, but this is what happens when someone from a different culture comes in. It's not what you say, but um, how you say it. Power distance, high power distance, members of society accept and expect that power is distributed unequally. Power is obeyed with little question. For example, in China or Saudi, Saudi Arabia, they don't question it. It is the way it is. And that's the way you do it in order to get along. I've heard more people talk about how many faithful Christians there are in China and people are wanting to do the same thing that we are. They're trying to get through life and they don't have any control. So what do you do when you don't have any control? Choose attitudes. That's it, according to Al on a Wednesday night devotional that I can't ever forget. Um, when you have total control, you choose you change people or change, you make decisions on what we're doing. And if you have partial control, you change methods. And if you have no control, you change your attitude. If you don't have any control, all you can do is change your attitude. And that's it. But if you're given some control, now you have some responsibility. Low power distance is distribution of power is viewed as a result of luck, money, or other variables. Others may challenge those in power. That's more like America. Who put you in charge? But that didn't start with America. Just go back to the Bible. That's what Korah's rebellion was all about. Korah said, who put Moses in charge? We want to do this. So there's so many biblical applications. You could just go on and name those. I just find it fascinating that it repeats over and over to varying degrees. Power distance. Individualism versus collectivism. Individualism, I'm standing up for myself. For example, it's a loosely knit social framework Individuals are expected to take, take care of themselves and the immediate family. I, self-image, what's good for me? That's the United States. What do you have in it for me? It's a consumer mindset. Coming to the church, you better serve me. That's not biblical. That's not the point of coming to church. Church is we're giving ourselves to the Lord. We're in his body. Collectivism is individuals expect relatives or others to look after them in exchange for unquestioning loyalty. It's a we self-image. Guatemala and China, it's family. You do help family. There's a difference. So you put those together and that's 
when you talk about a melting pot, that is it. Melting pot is you've got to find somewhere where we coexist. Let me go on a couple. I'll go qu more quickly, maybe. Long-term versus short-term. Long-term emphasis is placed on planning for the future. Where are we going? Short-term is immediate needs are more important than the future. Buy now versus later. And again, I can't help but Hezekiah is a perfect example of that. <clears throat> if you remember, Hezekiah is told, get his affairs in order, he's going to die. He goes to the Lord and says, Lord, would you please spare me? And I think it was because he didn't have any children. And who's going to pass on the, the uh, leadership to? He dies, and the Lord gives him 15 uh, years. And when he dies, he has a 13-year-old son, so he took care of matters. He quickly had a child. But what is interesting is he was told, you're, you're going to lose the kingdom. Hezekiah is told that. And what does Hezekiah say? Well, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. So it's, I mean, there's, there are inklings of it. It's human nature, the setting. You might even act differently if you're put in a different culture, short-term versus long-term. Masculinity versus femininity. Masculine, here we go. Preference for achievement, heroism, assertiveness, material rewards for success. Society is competitive. Japanese would model that. Uh, feminine would be a preference for cooperation, modesty, caring for the weak, quality of life, and that is characteristic of Sweden and Norway, if you're looking at countries. But may I tell you, I just read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, which when Paul is writing about his care for them, he uses feminine terms. Did you catch that? When he said in verse uh, 7, we prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. That's a man talking about his love for brothers and sisters. And so he's helping them. Having thus a fond affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. And then drop down to verse 11. Now he'll use characteristics that are more masculine. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So to say that there are masculine, if you're going to get in a fight over what's masculine and what's feminine, and men don't cry, real men don't cry, well, where did you get that? That, that was brought down somewhere to you, and you picked up on that, and you believed it. And it might be a part of a generation. When we talk about the greatest generation, many of them didn't show affection very well. Others did in different ways. And I suppose uh, I hit something there. I don't know what I hit, guys, but I lost my picture there. Um, but I would say that uh, many times, uh, you know, you've seen someone that they would say, I didn't, I didn't cry or um, I can't cry. That's, that's not because you're not feeling. You might show it in other ways, which would be getting sad or becoming depressed or something like that. I never did see, I don't ever remember uh, seeing my father cry. I, I just don't ever remember it. I don't, I'm not saying he didn't, but I know he was a deep feeling because I know he's a deep feeling person. He did it in other ways, but he could say some things that were very sad, but never, never shed a tear. And when I was preaching my mother's funeral, I didn't see him cry, but it was very, he was very involved and emotional. So that doesn't mean he wasn't emotional. It's just, that's not what he did. I took after my mother in that regard, I suppose. So I guess when we, it, we have to be careful when we have someone who cries in calling them, well, that's a, that's a womanly trait. That, that's, that's not right. It's, those are just emotions. We all handle our emotions differently. Indulgence versus restraint. Indulgence, rules are less restrictive. People communicate fewer messages of judgment and evaluation. With restraint, rigid guidelines on dress, food, drink that may even be formalized into law. There's some societies that are like this, and there's some countries that reflect this, and some people do. Um, I took it, this may be wrong, but this is the way I grew up thinking. Why was it in the South at church? You could answer this since you grew up in the South. I didn't go to church, but everyone wore bright clothing. I mean, I'd 
came to Freed Hardeman, and I remember some of those guys had bright yellow sport coats and suits, red suits. Um, Ira North, remember? Red sword, if you knew that. You know, he did that. In the North, I don't remember a lot of suits. Now, that's, they had suits. But here was the way I thought of it. In the South, you had a lot of businesses, people calling on one another. In the part of the country where I was from, they were all working in the factories. You weren't expected to dress up. You didn't dress up. So you came to church like you were, and they did like they were going to work. And it was more of, I, I took it as more of a social thing. I came to Freed Hartman with uh, one sport coat that I bought to get my senior picture made. And it was a corduroy brown sport coat. And I came in August to Henderson, Tennessee with a corduroy sport coat. And I got in a chorus and they said, you have to wear a uh, suit or a sport coat. And I had my corduroy thing on, and here I am. And I just think that's so funny. People would look at me. I didn't think anything about it because I, it didn't even dawn on me. But it's just differences, you know. I did get one, you know, eventually. Um, low and high uncertainty avoidance. A low uncertainty avoidance is change is seen as inevitable and normal. Innovation is praised. There are some societies where churches are, where change is just inevitable. Talking with, uh, about that with Tim Burrell at, uh, at, at Southeast, not Southeast, Sunset Institute of Bible. He's, and in Ukraine, he worked many years at Mariupol. And so that's in Ukraine, just outside of Donetsk. And what I told him, my thinking is that when you talk to people in Ukraine, even the changes they, that country has such a history of losing control, they're used to rolling with the punches. Just have to, hate to say it that way. It's just what's happening now. Let's just take it as it goes. So there's a war on. What are they going to do? They're going to keep on studying the Bible. God bless them. And they keep on serving. God bless them. Looking for new ministries. Now they're, they're picking up the idea they're dealing with soldiers in the war, and they're helping them. Good for them and they're talking with him about the Bible. So here we have Sasha and Natasha, I hate to bring them up because they're a great couple, great family, but think about it. Sasha and Natasha, here's Regina now in Harding at Searcy getting her education. Who knows what'll happen as she grows and Toma is now in Switzerland. She's had medical training and continues to be training and her life is going on. It's, it's just life as it, as it is. So there is a, low uncertainty avoidance, and then there's a high uncertainty avoidance, high value on doing things as they were done in the past, rigid codes of belief. And if you get caught up, this is the way it always ought to be in America, you're, you're really gonna struggle because it's life changes. We're, we're in different times. Technology has changed us. And so now, whereas we used to say, don't watch the television. You remember preachers saying that? Don't watch the television, that one-eyed monster. Do you remember those comments? One-eyed monster who was conveniently deaf. I mean, I heard it all my life, so just turn off the TV. Now, when we send children to school, what are they doing? They're giving them iPads. And now they're expected to learn how to use the technology. And it's, it's not a judgment call, it's a way of life. So we're struggling with it. That's just a thought. Halls, Edward Halls, addition, high versus low context cultures. Low context cultures, verbal communication is given primary attention, verbal communication. Listen to me. You can hear someone who is a verbal or an auditory learner. They'll use terms like that. I can't hear what you're saying. I don't want to hear that. That's an auditory learner. If someone is a visual learner, they give indications at times. At least this is what people think and, and uh, educational circles that would say, I can't see that. You know, I just, they'll use visual terms. I don't see it that way. You and I see things differently, don't we? And that's, they're probably a visual learner. If uh, someone is kinesthetic, is either visual, auditory, kinesthetic, it's th their feelings. So, well, you just, th that place was just so cold. Well, they're, they're looking for feelings. And I'm a visual learner. So I'm looking at the sites and looking at the people, and that's how I'm learning, just watching, observing, 
but others are listening for how you're talking. You sound so harsh. And then, then the kinesthetic would be, you know, you didn't seem to even care that I was there. You know, it's un you're hurting my feelings. So the assumption is that people will say what they mean relatively directly and clearly. Little will be left for the receiver to interpret or imply. In the U.S., if someone doesn't want something, we expect them to say, no, don't want it, please. High context cultures, nonverbal communication is as important, if not more important, than verbal communication. How something is said is a significant variable interpreting what is meant. Messages, messages are often implied and delivered quite subtly. You say, this is not Bible. It is absolutely Bible. That's the whole point. What does Paul say when he writes to the church at Corinth? He says, people say that his letters, talking about Paul, his letters are impressive, but boy, his appearance is not impressive and his speech is contemptible. So that he's dealing with that issue. And so what he writes to them in saying, what I am in print is what I am in person. I'm not inconsistent. He was a sharp guy. So we have to learn how to deal with that, different, con different cultures. Let me stop there. Your thoughts, anything, is, you might say, this is not, I don't read book, chapter, and verse. So I could give you book, chapter, and verse on all of these if we looked at it, but it's, we're talking about how if the church is going to exist, and it is, how it's going to exist is up to us, how we're going to work with people and uh, meet them where they are and go with them where we all want to be, which is in the presence of the Lord. Thoughts? Yes, of course you can't. Here's, let me give you an example where that doesn't happen. What do we prefer, a phone call or a text? Depends on the person. What do most people, Al, <laughs> well, let me say younger people, text. Don't bother me with a call. Well, what do you lose when you send a text? It's primarily verbal. The only way you can change it to something that is not is use, the, use the, the issues that I've tried to use, words that are indicators of this. When you hear someone, when you hear someone say, if you're, if you're teaching a class and it's just, and uh, I mean, there used to be visual indicators, but you're trying to communicate with someone and in preaching, I know in teaching, you're trying to do all three, trying to hit sight, he, hearing and, and, and telling a story. The old thing was, if you want to be a good speaker, you've got to make them laugh, cry, and to think. If you can do that, you've done well. Well, what is that? Laugh, cry, or think. You're trying to impress the emotions on what you can, so you're trying to connect. And that's what, uh, that's what we do with each other. We're enjoying one another's company and it's because we're, learn we're listening and learning. But texting is, have you ever gotten a text and you said, I don't know if this guy's mad at me or not? You know, when you just get a simple, no. Are you ready to meet today for lunch? No. Okay, did I say something? Now I've got it, that's another text. Everything okay? Now, you know, now we've got 10 texts going back and forth where if I were to call the person, hey, can you meet today at noon? Not today then I, that's, that's not bad, that's, that's okay, no problem, move on. It's, it's all of that. It would be, but now that's always been the case too, it's the old story of two preachers listening and they listened to one and he said, if you don't do this, you're going to hell, and the other one said, if you don't do this, you're going to hell, and one made them mad and the other one didn't, and what was the difference? The difference is the one that said you're going to hell, it's not, it, it was almost like he was glad that he was saying that. And the other one was hurt. You know, it's, it's the old, if you don't do this, you're going to hell. Or uh, saying, if we don't do this, we're not going to heaven. It's just the way you say it and how you do it. And that's a, that's a nonverbal. But it still involves the verbs, you know, is how we say it. So Paul was very careful with this, I think, as he's talking about it. Time consciousness. 
Now, Sundar and I, we laughed about this because I didn't think he was like he is. Is, he, is we, When you travel with someone, I'm telling you, you learn a lot, and it's good. And sometimes you have to have a, a kind of a, let's get together and talk about this. And we did, and that was good. Monochronic culture is time is money. Monochronic. Chronic is the time. Chronos is the word for time. So mono is one. one. Time is money. Punctuality and scheduling are important. Handling one task at a time is valued. Being busy is valued. What are you doing? Busy, busy, busy. What are you doing? But what are you doing? No, well, not in anything, really. I'm just busy, busy, busy. Why? Because you wouldn't want to say, I haven't done anything in an hour. Man, I'm just distracted and haven't accomplished anything. Polychronic, many time culture, time is fluid. Schedules are rough outlines to be followed, altered, or ignored. Schedules don't, do not drive activity. Multitasking is more acceptable, have a lot of things going on. When I went to Baxter Institute for the graduation, I sat there on time. I showed up in uh, Honduras, showed up ready to go, and it was 45 minutes before it started. And they didn't seem to be bothered by it at all. And I was ready, you know. When does this plane leave? I'm ready to go. So that, that doesn't happen. So there are barriers, and that's, this, is a, this is what people are learning in society on how to handle it if you understand what is the response to intercultural communication. And I, what I'm saying is we're watching it lived out in the Bible if we just saw it, and we're watching it in church lived out as well. And people don't even know when they're doing it. It's like coming in late, and then leaving early and saying the people are not, they're just not friendly. You didn't have a chance, you didn't give us a chance. Or a person that uh, comes one time and hears something and says, boy, you never talk about fill in the blank. Well, how would you know? You know, you hadn't been here half time. And the easy answer is, well, I've, I watched it on live stream. Well, that's great, that's good, I'm glad. So you have anxiety, assumption of similarities, Ethnocentrism, which is the way we do it in America, is the way to do it. And for those that want to go to another country and try to make it like a, if you try to treat Ukraine like America, you're making a huge mistake. It's just not the same place. Everything, everything is different. Even, um, even the, the most interesting part to me was uh, compensation. Doctors were at the bottom of the, the scale of pay. Miners, coal miners, were at the top. Why is that? Because you make money from that. Educators and uh, doctors are at the low point. Because, why is that? Because they, have, they had at that time, I'll just say history of, a lot of people, so the value of life is very low. And that's, that's cher we cherish that here. So it's, a, it's not only a challenge, it is a joy to be able to be a part of a group that's trying to make a difference. And I think we have a need not only to have the right view of what the Bible says, but also um, to express it in ways consistent with a Christian perspective. Now I've done a lot of talking. Questions or comments? Yeah, why do we do this this way? It's the way we've always done it, yeah. And that's true. And it's, it's not necessarily bad. He, uh, Norman Bales even talks about, as he brings out all of the thoughts that people um, have. Listen to the chapters, I, I'm not gonna go through. Measuring evangelistic success. Why do we lose so, mem so many members? What is an incorporated member? What prevents incorporation effectiveness? And the tie that binds us together, what is that tie? The importance of fellowship. Does your congregation extend friendship? Love one another, the nuts and bolts of relationship building. He's getting right down to where we live because if you have a family that's not teaching it or living it, uh, it's hard to, to learn how. And I, I was talking with my brother about some other things, but he was talking about a church they were talking about things than, uh, that people learn. And he, he made the comment, he said, you know, and I agree with him, he's my brother, I, but he said, we experienced it, he said at home, 
it was never any different at home than it was at church. We, there was, that was the way we lived. That was it. So there was no difference in um, what we believed. Mom and Dad just said it, but they also did it. So if it, we're watching Andy Griffin and Aunt B answer the phone and turn to Andy and said, it's for you, Andy, are you at home? And I remember this episode because she did it. And he's, he said, tell her I'm not at home. Tell her I'm not at home. And mom said, cut that off. He's lying. That's a lie. We don't want to hear that. Lot. Andy Griffin, you're cutting off Andy Griffin. But it was a lie. And we got a lesson right there. All the kids got a lesson. That's not, don't do that. And if you go to the store and you get Underwood deviled ham, which we liked and we ate a lot of, um, if I give you a dollar and it costs 25 cents, I expect to get 75 cents change. If it costs 98, I want that two cents too. That's the right thing to do. Well, that's just the way you grow up, but it's just a different, it's a different world because we don't have parents that are standing up and saying it. And we don't have coaches that are standing up to players and we don't have teachers that are helping students. It's, there's a lot of issues, isn't, aren't there? Well, what we need to be is God's people. Now that's, I ended that on a sour note, and I apologize. That's not meant to be. But I'd like us to talk about this a little more. We just have a couple of more sessions. But then where is the church going to be? Boy, I hope that we live as God's people, as a family of believers, loving each other and caring for one another through the highs and the lows, as Sundar said. And we all have them, and how can we get through them? And so we... We want to do that. Would you bow with me and let's pray. Father, there are so many that we do think about in our church family. We've mentioned many of those who are facing difficulties. Jana Lynn losing her mother. And uh, Father, there are so many people that are struggling. We do pray for Jerry as he prepares for his procedure. We pray that it will be very successful and he'll be able to, to do the things he wants to do as well. We pray that you'll bless this church, our elders, our deacons, every member, every parent, and every child. Help us to do things that would bring glory to your name, for this is our intent, and this is our purpose, and this is our goal. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. <laughs>